Right, good stuff. So as I said, I'm James. I'm going to run through the presentation. Should take about 10, 15 minutes to give you an insight on the professional assessment route to become a chartered member with CIAT. Ultimately, it is up to you to demonstrate your knowledge and understanding, your experience, your professionalism against the requirements as defined within the professional standards framework, which was provided in the information before this session. Um, and then I'll just invite Barry to introduce himself first and then Gordon and Paul. So over to you, Barry, quickly. You're on mute, Barry. OK, morning. I'm Barry LeBevon from Jersey and the Channel Islands. Um, been on council since 1989, past um, president of the Institute. I've also been involved in two universities as, um, as an external examiner, and I've been doing this job as a membership assessor for eight or nine years now. Um, and we'll put some more beef to the bones um, after uh, James' presentation. Hello, I'm Gordon Cole. Um, I have a, my own practice here in Northampton. I've done a lot of work with CIET over many, many years. I run my practice uh, as a chartered practice for 32 years uh, and do a fair bit of work in academia as well. As Barry says, probably expand a bit more later. OK, thanks, Gordon and Barry. My name is Paul Laycock. I'm West Midlands Region. I am an academic at the moment. I, I lead the area within Birmingham City University that looks after architectural technology and building surveying and possibly other subjects in the future. Um, Barry was one of my external examiners, actually. He kept me straight on my course for a number of years. Previous to being an academic, I was actually a director in a design organisation, and that's why I became qualified. And welcome to everybody today. Back to you, James. Thank you. So. I'd like to envisage that most of the people in this room are either currently registered as an associate member or an affiliate or have plans to apply and join as an associate member or an affiliate because you do need to be registered at one of those two levels to submit an application for chartered membership. Um, if you're not sure on your joining routes and your educational requirements and our processes to come in at the associate or affiliate level, then we can discuss that outside this session over email. But the plan is that anyone that's a, as an associate or an affiliate is just sitting at that holding level until they progress on and become a qualified professional as a chartered architectural technologist who comes with the designation MCIAT. And then as of earlier this year, there's also a complementary class of membership, which is fellow membership that would sit alongside your chartered status for those individuals that can demonstrate significant contribution to architectural technology and or excellence in architectural technology. So. There are aspirational achievements for you to look to progress there onwards once you become a chartered member, but that's what we're going to focus on today. So I get asked quite a bit, you know, what's the standard route of progression or how long might it take me to become a chartered member of CIAT? Now, if you've got the relevant knowledge and understanding or the academic qualification required to demonstrate stage one, as well as the relevant experience that can demonstrate your breadth and depth of capability as an architectural technologist to demonstrate stage two, you could say a lot of people in this room are probably there or thereabouts already to submit an application to become a chartered member. So you might not need to do any additional project based work. It would all about be you pulling together a portfolio to show the repertoire and the breadth and depth of your experience to show us your capabilities. The issues affecting completion are generally time, energy and motivation and in some instances experience. But that time, energy and motivation is something that we can't allocate to you. That's for you as an individual to make that step and strive to qualify. But as a standard rule, if you do an honours degree for three years and you've got three good years experience, you should be well placed to apply to become a chartered member. So if any of you are fitting over that bracket of more than three years good experience, it's just a matter of dotting the I's, crossing the T's, pulling your submission together and submitting the documentation to CIAT. And obviously at the end of that, you sit your interview. So the criteria that you need to demonstrate are defined within the professional standards framework. As I said in the introduction, the standards framework was sent out with this invite to the seminar, as were the candidate guidance notes, as well as the professional assessment application form you need to fill in complete, as well as some completed exemplars to show you how other architectural technology professionals in different spheres within the discipline have demonstrated stages one, two and three to become a chartered member. So stage one, educational standards. That's an assessment of your knowledge and understanding of architectural technology. If you have a CIAT accredited honours or master's degree, you will be exempt from stage one. 
you just write on the form exempt C certificate from X university graduated in whichever year. You should have a good idea if you have a CIAT accredited qualification. Obviously in RIBA part one, it's not accredited, hence it's in the name of the RIBA part one, nor would a building surveying degree accredited by RICS. Now, if you're not exempt from that section, we will come to what you need to address and how you can prove that point. Moreover, once you've demonstrated your knowledge and understanding, your stage two is your practice standards. That's an assessment of your project based work experience. And the four areas defined within the framework are showing your design capabilities, your management experience, the facets of practice you've been involved in and your self-development aims and objectives. And again, we'll provide more detail on what could cover those four areas within stage through further on through your presentation. But everybody and anybody that wants to qualify must provide a practice based portfolio to meet the standards as defined within the framework. Furthermore, your final stage before you become a charter member, which is covered at professional interviews and assessment of your professional standards, and it aligns to the code of conduct, you know, how you act accordingly at all times as a representative of CIAT as a charter member. Um, and then obviously once you're a chartered architectural technologist, so, you know, chartered membership of any organisation, so chartered engineer, chartered accountant, whatever it might be, you know, that has a global currency, it has a kudos, it has a status and it has recognition in some areas if, with regards to a UK context in that as a chartered member, you can run any project of any size from start to finish as long as within your capabilities. Other member states within the EU or other jurisdictions around the world, it might vary differently depending on what the regulations and the obligations are. But, you know, charter membership is a benchmark of your knowledge, skills and experience. So stage one, for those of you that aren't exempt, there's nine bullet points within the professional standards framework under educational standards. And in the application form, it states you need to provide a written narrative of at least 3000 words and no more than 5000 words. So basically, you need to answer each of those bullet points with somewhere in the region of 350 words per bullet point to demonstrate your knowledge and understanding of that respective process or criteria we're asking you about. It would be sensible to outline where and how you've attained that knowledge and understanding. So you could have a relevant academic qualification and or professional qualification that could have given you that know how of that specific area. You may well have undertaken some CPD or some training in a certain subject topic that's given you knowledge against one of those nine bullet points. You may well have read and done some research in regards to manual literature or articles on a certain topic or a way I learned a lot of my role is called reflective practice. So that's just learning on the job through your peers, whether it be through shadowing and or mentoring or just on the job experience. But in essence, you need to provide a written narrative addressing each specific point, outlining where and how you know those specific topics. A good analogy I can give you is the modern style driving test. You pass your theory test saying I know how to do X, Y and Z in a certain instance that shows you know how to do it. But it's a different ball game to actually show that you can drive and implement that know how and drive proficiently. And that's the differential and a good comparator you'll understand between our stage one of your knowledge and understanding and our stage two of saying show us what you've actually done and show us you can take that theory and that knowledge and provide a professional competent service based on your sphere of practice. Now, through this whole process, you will need a referee. So a referee needs to be a fully qualified built environment professional. So MCIAT, ARB, MRICS, MCIOB, you know, uh, MRIAI, whatever it might be, you've probably got a good idea of who this person could and should be. Um, generally, you know, as a line manager or a partner or a colleague you work with, that knows your experience and it can vouch for what you're putting in your documentation. Now, for some of you that might be lacking experience or awareness of certain processes, your referee may use some questions to ascertain whether you've got that know-how, set a research project or a case study or a simulation to see whether they're confident that you know what needs to be done in a certain circumstance. So again, nine bullet points, 350 words per point roughly should stand you in a good stead. So, practice standards this is a portfolio of your work experience my two favorite things are i want to see a good breadth of your experience and i want to see a good depth of your experience we're looking for quality over quantity but it should all relate to your specific roles and functions your level of experience and what you've done in your career that you feel can demonstrate the various layers to your capability to ciat so in this section 
you do need to collate and collect evidence as appropriate as you've attained it. And the good news is you can backdate this whole section against previous projects worked upon. So this is where it reinforces what I said. Some of you have probably done all the project based work you need. You just need to pull together your submission against the criteria within stage two. So as I said, all of you will need to demonstrate your capabilities in designing, managing, practicing and developing self. And as you fill in each of those sections for stage two, again, there's another word limit. Now you're probably looking towards the upper end. So we're looking at somewhere in the region of 2000 words altogether. So 500 words per section, maybe a little bit more if you need it to add context, but we don't want 6000 words or 10,000 words because the idea is your succinct summary will then reference supporting appendices of evidence and that appendices with evidence from projects will show your capability to practice as an architectural technology professional. But again, if you follow this basis, you should be in a good, good place and moving in the right direction. Name the project or projects you're going to use in that section. Explain and how it dem satisfies and demonstrates your experience. You know, be clear on your role within the process. Collaborative team working is the name of the game. So I did this, my team did this. And if it's a big project, the other teams and the other um, parts of the COG did all these processes. But my main role was this. That shows us your picture and your breadth and depth and your layers of experience. And ultimately, you need to start having an appendices of documentation to provide to us as necessary. And when we look at documentation and what might be provided, we'll come to that further on through. But in essence, if you fill in stage one and stage two, you provide your narrative and any supporting evidence against the areas. You can then give that to your referee who should be critiquing your work, because if they know you and they can't understand the points you're trying to make, we may well struggle from our side because we won't have met you. And then they will sign it off and say, yes, I'm happy that in my professional opinion, you've addressed the criteria. You can now submit that to CIAT. Now, what is the scope of an architectural technology professional? You know, we're all different. We've all got different experiences. And this process is about you painting your own picture and telling your own journey to CIAT. For those working on the project delivery process, a good benchmark is the RIBA plan of work. You know, it's generally known around the world. And it covers various stages. Now, if you're a job runner and you run projects from start to finish, covering the full scope of the plan of works, we would expect to see explanations and supporting evidence to show your experience across the range of functions that you say you're proficient to do. If you happen to specialise in a niche area or you just get involved in RIBA work stages four and five, that's fine. That will be the main crux of your submission. You just need to demonstrate you've got an awareness of all the other RIBA work stages and all the other professionals that are involved in that. And just be clear on I come in at this this stage of the um, project puzzle. And these are the pieces of the puzzle that I need to do in relation to my roles and functions at the time I'm applying to become a chartered member. So when we're looking at designing, managing, developing what facets of practice you might have been involved in, your application could incorporate all of these one of these or a few of these. So if you're a specialist in historic building conservation, that's all you do. That will be the main strand to your submission. If you're a specialist in the BIM arena, that would be the main strand to your submission. But it might be the fact that you're a generalist and you do a little bit of all of these. So you'd bring in health and safety and CDM, you bring in project management. You might look at the sustainability aspects of a project. You might do a bit of building surveying. You know, it's your opportunity, it's your pick and mix. You can cherry pick anything and everything that add these layers for breadth and depth showing your capability and your experience the more layers you've got the stronger your application is because it shows your proficiency across a range of functions um, if you want to drill down a bit further you know what building typologies or what type of projects could i bring into my submission if you solely work for a practice that focuses in the residential market that's fine that will be the focus of your submission however if you happen to work for a larger um, organization or practice and they specialize in one sector or a few of these sectors the more different types of building projects you can bring in the stronger your application because they'll have different client requirements different project delivery processes different contracts you know different legal and statutory obligations for each stage of the process so it's up to you to bring that blend in and pull that together within your submission but again it should give you a steer on the types of projects you can work on and bring into your submission now as I said, once you filled it in, once you're happy, your referee's happy, you can then submit that to CIAT. So everything's being done remote at the moment. So it's £350 to submit your professional assessment. 
And ideally, we'd like it via Dropbox, WeTransfer, OneDrive, Google Drive, whatever electronic submission format you have. We we'll need the application form and we need all the supporting appendices of evidence that you've referenced within your application. That will come in. People like Barry, Paul, Gordon will look through your submission. They will get your written narrative. They'll read the word in and understand where you are, what you do. They'll look at what you've explained, you're proficient and got experience in. Then they'll look at the supporting documents, say, right, has he provided evidence where he says he's a job runner or he's a, he's a specialist consultant on BIM? Where's his evidence? What does he do? Let me check it. Let me make a decision as to whether we feel they're ready to be passed the interview. About 50, 60 percent pass first time round. You might get a first deferral, i.e. we need further clarification on a certain point or you've talked about an experience, but there's no evidence. We actually need to see that evidence, please. You resubmit that when you're ready. We look at it again. Hopefully you pass, move on. You might get a second deferral. I was still not happy on this specific point with what you've explained or what you've provided as evidence. Please look at this again and resubmit for a third and final submission. So you get three chances to submit your stages one and two for assessment to be passed to interview. Now, interviews as well, they're all going to be held via Zoom for the remainder of this year. Come 2022, we'll review. And like most people, a bit like working from home, we'll probably have a blend of both face to face regional interviews and Zoom interviews. But, you know, from from today to being qualified, quickest you're probably looking is four to six weeks, subject to you doing that time, energy and motivation and filling in the application. But Zoom interviews can be held every week if there's enough demand. You know, Paul's actually doing an interview board today and he's joined us on his lunch break. Um, so what will the interview cover? So the interview is going to be based around the information in your application. It will relate to your background, your experience, your knowledge and understanding and awareness of the project delivery process, your experience, your professionalism. So the recurring theme there is you. It's an interview about you. And the word interview, yep, sort of makes people a little bit nervous sometimes, but really just treat it as a professional discussion with your peers because you'll, there'll be two chartered architectural technologists. They won't see your portfolio. They'll see your written form. They'll see the report form that the panel has given to them. Should they like them to steer the discussion down a certain way? There are no trick questions. There is no set list of questions. It will all be based around your application. It lasts for 45 minutes. You get the result on the day. You just leave for 10, 15 minutes. We bring you back in and we convey the result. The, re the pass rate at the moment is 90% for interview because if you're not strong enough, you're getting a first deferral, you're getting a second deferral, you're asking for more evidence or more explanation of your experience before you get to that point. If you get referred, we'll give you verbal feedback on the day what came across as deficient, and then we'll formalise that in writing within 10 working days. And then after three months, you can reapply once you're confident in your competence and experience to address the referral points we highlighted, and you have a 30 minute interview honing in on those areas. Now, if you want to find out a bit more about the qualifying process, then you know you can check out our YouTube channel as well to see some previous workshops akin to this, information on fellow membership and an, an interview film from people that have recently been through the process. Um, obviously, I'm here to help you as much as I can. I can't comment as to whether your supporting evidence is technically proficient because I'm not an architectural technology professional. I have seen hundreds, if not thousands of professional assessment application forms. So if you've got to the point where you filled in the form, your referee's happy, you're happy, then by all means, you can pop me over your final draft and say, James, just, you know, just wouldn't mind if you could give this a quick once over. Let me know that if it came to you or your team, you would actually sign this off and send it off to the panel for assessment. Because sometimes we get them and they haven't addressed the word limit, they haven't addressed the standards framework. Um, it's not given the process the due respect it deserves. Sometimes we won't even give it to the panel. We'll go back to the applicant and say, I'm sorry, the evidence is not referenced or you've given us just one massive document with 800 pages of documentation you need to break it down into each individual appendices so the panel can make a judgment in a professional manner and in a fair manner um, but that's pretty much all i've got to say um, i'm going to invite barry to come in next and then gordon and then paul and then after that we'll just open it up to the floor to answer any questions you've got and also, if you've got any questions, you can just put them in the chat box and we can come to them as we go through. Right. Thanks, James. Um, section C is the important part for us, because in section C at the top of that, we need if you uh, you're, you're actually giving us a diarization, of your career. 
and what you actually do. So you, if you put up everything you do on a daily event in bullet points, we expect to see evidence to cover that. We also, where you talk about your past careers, we're also interested if you've done something else, block laying, you're a carpenter, you don't um, get um, stopped because you've done another career. Some careers will help you out in your architectural technology. That's what it's all about. You're, you know how to build, or you, when you become a member, you're supposed to know how to build it as well as design it. Anyway, this is not an exam. You can actually um, talk to colleagues about what you're putting down as your evidence. You, it, if there are uh, other staff members that are doing their portfolio, talk to each other. We're not going to penalise you for that. There's no time limit. So once you've started, it, and, and if you did get a, um, a deferral in at, at uh, this stage, you don't have to get it back in a week. It can be months' time. It's entirely up to you. We all, all appreciate how um, busy you are. Uh, the one thing we're not interested in is thousands and thousands of drawings. You do more than that. You, you correspond with people. You prepare other documents, specifications. We need to see evidence of that. I've just, I looked at an um, evidence yesterday and it was purely all drawings. It doesn't tell us about what you do. Um, so we want correspondence with your clients, your engineers, people like that. We're not really interested in photographs. They don't prove anything to us that, you're with you, that it's your involvement. Sorry lights out. Um, evidence used in covering the education can be used in other other sections so it's not as if you've got to provide certain evidence in one section and then you can't use it again in another uh, a second section. When it comes to interview um, and this job it's all about being confident in yourself. It's only you that can blow your own trumpet so at interview it's all about your character that's what they want to see and your confidence in yourself. Um, also, we understand you're not involved in all parts of a project. This doesn't prevent you from becoming a member of the Institute, but it, what it does do, it means you must comply by the, the code of conduct, where if you haven't done certain areas, you can't um, meet with clients and, uh, and do a full um, process with them because you could get caught out and uh, end up before the conduct committee. And lastly, um, we also understand people that work in for instance, the nuclear industry, the chemical industry, criminology, um, their evidence would have to be redacted or they'd have difficulty. Providing you you can use a fictional um, project, you can call it um, Disney Towers if you like, if it's a, in the nuclear industry, and, and just give us a, your narrative of how you've gone about doing this sort of thing. You may not be able to give us some drawings or all the drawings, uh, you know, the detailed drawings, things like that but you're not uh, penalised for being in those industries. You, you can apply. And lastly, I would say um, we're here. You can phone us up and talk to us if you want to um, and join us on LinkedIn and ask questions and help you out. And, and nobody's mentioned yet mentors. So you can also get one of us or a colleague to be a mentor in this to help you out. But you're not there. You're not out there alone. Um, I'll hand over to Gordon now. I think I've spoken enough. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think Barry's touched on most things that I can. Uh, I think you need to take on board. Some of the stuff might be best just to reiterate bits of James's and bits of Barry's. So the um, your submission is actually looked at by other professionals. So the people in your interview will not have seen any of that uh, work that you so diligently put together and submitted. Uh, they've looked at that, assessed it probably looked at it more than once. If Barry's the same as me, I look at them two or three times, especially if they're not put together very easily to navigate your way around. So try and think of the people who are looking at that work. And then if it's successful and uh, they put you forward for an interview, the interview, as again, both Barry and James said, is, is fairly informal. It is into an interview and quite clearly it's important to you. Even at my age, I can remember the day I had my interview and it was um, some time ago now um, and I can remember it distinctly. It's engraved on my brain, so I know you'll be nervous. Perhaps the, the Zoom or Teams interviews are not quite so bad, maybe I'm not sure, um, but it is nice to get to know you face to face, which from what James says will be next year. Um, if you don't know the answer to some of the questions that people are asking you at interview, just um, hands up and admit that's an area of um, 
architecture that I don't deal with. We would rather you do that than try to waffle your way through. We're sort of hard, grizzled old technologists, so we've been doing it so long we'll probably see through that. There won't be any trick questions, as everybody says. Um, you will be put at your ease, and it takes about 45 minutes. Um, we're not looking at your te technical skills. We won't ask you where to put a DPC in a wall or anything like that. So, so don't worry about that. Um, I, th I think it's perhaps best if you, um, uh, if we go back to Paul, who might add some more bits on academia, um, and uh, and perhaps back to James and get some questions for those attending. I guess. OK, thanks both. Excellent points. Certainly reinforce all of that. I'll add two things. Um, for me, what, but the comment I get most often is, where do I start? I can't start. What do I do first? Uh, Barry mentioned Section C. I would say go back to Section C. That's your current job description. Just list out what you do. So start there. This is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, a week-to-week -week basis, on a typical contract, wherever that might be. Then use that to start to allocate those different areas into the sections, expand, narrate, and add the evidence. And very quickly, you'll set up a first draft of your, your application. That falls into the next point. Use mentors, use colleagues, use existing members. Get in contact with your local region and speak to your aspiration group. A, a recent addition to the local regions and centres, the aspiration group specifically is set up to address the people in your situation, sort of graduates, people come to membership and brand new members. So you're surrounded by people who are going through and have just gone through the exact same process you're involved in. Make use of them and also get it proofread as well. We read far too many with glaring spelling mistakes and the English just doesn't quite hang together. So it needs to be easy for us to read, easy for us to assess. I'll leave it there, hand back to James. Yeah, I just think at that point, I'm gonna <clears throat> open it up to the floor really. If anyone's got any questions, so if you either put your hand up or put something in the text box, that's not a problem. But, you know, we're, we're here to answer any questions you've got. But I see Harry's got his hand up, so we we'll go to Harry. Hello, hi there. Um, I am qualified to HNC level. I have no degrees. Uh, I've been in the industry for 17 years now, um, working as a trainee technician to a technician. I'm now actually work, currently working as a senior. Um, yeah, but I'm only qualified to HNC uh, within design and construction. Is this an issue? No, not at all. You just sure. need to address stage one. Like I said, the nine bullet points, yep. you need to convey where you got your knowledge and understanding from. So I okay. assume your HNC was a considerable amount of years ago. So yes, knowledge and understanding you've got from that. Yeah, like that. You know, it will stand you in good stead and you can refer to and say, I've got a HNC and these are the modules I'd study as an introductory mm -hmm. narrative. But then you could just look at the specific points and think, actually, how have I evolved in those areas? And where have I got my knowledge and understanding of those points from? Have I picked it up through my career learning on the job? Or have I done some CPD in a specific area? So it's just how you formulate your narrative. I mean, I have got an example of how someone has mapped and used their HNC as a benchmark for that. But I don't know how much value that would add to you, considering it was moons ago. It was a long time ago, mate. Yeah, 2006, I believe. Um, so, but uh, I mean, I've got amples of portfolio. I mean, like I said, I've been doing it for 17 years, mate. So, um, so there's a lot of portfolio there. But yeah, it's just that. I think it's just that education bit. I think I probably. It isn't just fine. Um, I'll let you into a secret. Don't yeah. tell anybody else. I only have a HND. So do I. That. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I don't have any of that. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't Both Man of Gardens I, I, I was a couple of years before 2006. Sorry, Barry. Yeah. You know, I, I um, worked for 10 years before I took the what was the TEC in those days, because I've been in this industry uh, coming up to 50 years. Uh, oh. And I've gone right the way through without any real serious exams. So Yeah, I mean, the best way to summarize is we see equal value, equal value, equal value in on-the-job learning and experience. So it won't preclude you. You've just got to go through and address those nine points in part in and bringing in to demonstrate where you've got your know-how of those topics so that the likes of Barry, Paul and Gordon can understand it when it comes to them. Of course, of course. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, I'll just go to Ross next. Hi, how's it going? Uh, I think Harry answered my, um, my my first question there anyway, OK? Just about, about um, education standards, OK? So I'll skip that bit. My next one was um, you, you said don't don't like uh, have lots and lots of drawings uh, with with the submission. OK, and that's fair enough. 
uh, you, you mentioned we could you could you know you know uh, you, you could use a specification but specifications are some of my specifications are 400 pages you don't want to you don't want a 400 page specification document yeah. many people do put it that they put it forward it, 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 we don't read it we just want yeah. to see if you're actually producing something okay like that. okay so like so would, would it would it if, if we took a section out of a specification yeah fine. yeah okay and, and and similarly even then ross you you may want to annotate the specification to point to exactly what you did or to make a particular point yeah okay the same with okay. any of the any other evidence that could be a drawing as well Okay, and then I, I guess like a, like a finisher schedule, a sanctuary schedule, all that kind of stuff, just just to to get to get away from drawings. I, I know you want to see some drawings, but yeah. to, to show like specification schedules, drawings, uh, meet, meeting minutes, we chair meeting minutes, chair yeah, meetings, all, all that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah. okay. Basically, the full gambit of what you might do day to day, yeah. you cherry pick the things out to show that breadth and depth and the layers of what you actually do. That's what we want to see. So it's almost you can pick a mix, whatever you want to put in, whatever you want to justify, whatever you want to explain. You're the artist. You paint the picture. You tell us the story. You give us the snippets of documentation to show us your roles and responsibilities. That should enable us to get a good snapshot of you and make an informed judgment, as long as there's evidence to back up statements. Yeah, I think we had these questions last time. People were saying how many projects, and and we vary between three projects, one project maybe, or five, but not hundreds. Yes. Um, we do need to see minutes all about communication. So mm. we do need to see perhaps an agenda you've drawn up, perhaps the, the minutes of the meeting. What about when you go on site? Some people use an iPad to do snagging. Some people just uh, mark up a drawing with a felt tip yeah. pen. That's all great. Of yeah, yeah, site inspections. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about survey? You I'm know, just you do a say, survey, yeah. uh, scan a survey and put a couple of surveys in there just to show that you really do. So if you do, you mm. don't have to. Um, and well, don't you have a sketch? Yeah, have sketches sketch. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I, have, I have some hand sketches that I'm going to use. Yeah, yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. Don't draw them again. Just send, send the scrappy yeah. ones that have got raindrops on them and all that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Coffee. Yeah. Stuff. Everything. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Coffee. I mean, stuff. you know, it's contract administration documents. It's presenting proposals to clients. It's planning applications. It's the full gambit. You know, all of this. All of you are going. Oh, yeah, done that. Done that. Done that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You just need to start pulling it together in a professional submission to show us those layers to the things you, you do and you've done. Yeah, you could put a little paper trail in, like maybe a planning application that had a bit of a couple of issues that you had to resolve and amend drawings or or building regs that, you know, you completely forgot to put foundation depth or something in and you you had to sort that out. Conflict of interest is some term that you'll hear a lot. And if you've got one of those, um, if you're calling from Ireland, you've probably got some builders that are a bit bolshy when you're on site, bricklayers. And, and stuff. So, how do you resolve those problems when they're mm. when they're screaming at you? Perhaps um, you just got to be calm, collected, which I'm sure you are. And then you just wander back to the office and say, oh, oh, "I'll get back to you." That's some, that's some site agent ringing me. That is probably sorry about that. Um, right. Anybody else? Any comments? Is that right, Ross? Ross. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, uh, Lewis. Or did we cover your one? Uh, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, I'm sort of in the same boat as Harry, but I think he sort of answered my question, um, just sort of addressing the nine bullet points. It's just for if I'm in Scotland, um, what do I join as, as an associate or an affiliate with the level four English qualification? Basically, if you've got a Scottish H HN qualification, that's fine for associate, as long right. as you're not offering private services to clients through your own practice, or even if it's part time, full time, friends or family, the code's quite clear. You're not, you, you can offer services, but you have to comply with our registration requirements and advise the institute and we'll tell you what we need from you, such as PI, et cetera, et cetera. So that stands for everybody. If you're offering private services, ad hoc, paid, unpaid, friends, family, that's a service. You need to register with the institute, you need to get PI, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. Thank right, you. Jamal, I, I know you're waiting and we'll come back to Harry. Oh yes, thank you. Good afternoon, James and everyone uh, here. Um, uh, basically, I don't have an uh, architectural technology uh, degree, uh, but I have an um, architectural engineering degree. That's my first degree. And then I have my uh, master in architectural design. And also I have a PhD in architectural technology from Dumont University. 
the thing is, uh, I don't have that much really uh, experience in practice uh, in, in architecture technology. I started my uh, first job as an architectural assistant for three years, then I joined academia. Uh, I have uh, some experience teaching architectural technology at DeMont University, De Montfort University for three and a half years. Uh, that's an architectural technology uh, program. And then I also I was teaching about a year and a half at Heritage Watt University as assistant professor uh, in architectural engineering. But as I said, uh, I don't have really that much of uh, experience in architectural technology. Even uh, the, 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 the projects that I was involved in is, is more architectural drawings rather than uh, technical drawings. But uh, I've just started um, a new job in the company, a construction company here in Scotland. Uh, it's interesting. So it's um, we have about 13 retrofitting projects, shallow and deep retrofitting projects. So probably that somehow related to architecture technology field. So we do uh, in install insulation and all these things, uh, even vapor uh, membranes. Uh, this is first uh, first question is uh, so the, the experience that I have is, is not really um, probably technical uh, or that much of technical details or drawings. So probably uh, my question is how my um, qualification is, is is related to architecture technology or would it be really um, sufficient for to be a qualifying as a bimbo? Well, basically, so in section B, there is a yeah. progression mechanism so you can be a design progression mechanism, you can be a specialist, you can be an academic, you can be a researcher, you can be yeah. an other if you're a particular specialist. So this whole process is designed to be flexible and fluid for you yes. to paint your own picture related to your journey in architectural technology. So you've had a journey in architectural technology yes. and your outputs are just as valuable as anyone else in this room with regards to building and putting back into the profession and the discipline and raising the profile. But what you need to do is you need to pitch yeah. it clearly so that the likes of Paul, Barry and Gordon, when they read through your submission, they understand your roles and functions, your responsibilities, and they see clear evidence of your outputs in that yeah. specialist stream of academic and research of architectural technology within the industry. So it's just as valuable to the practitioners running projects or working on projects. Right. It's your own stream within architectural technology that we need to see. Oh, that's that's great. Uh, I'm also a certified passive house designer and uh, a certified uh, BIM uh, coordinator as well, working towards also the uh, past 2035 uh, retrofit coordinator. So I'm doing the the training right now, but hopefully these you know these um, uh, this will be an evidence to be qualified. Uh, I just have another question on section G uh, regarding the management. Uh, so what management rule you would like to see? for someone applying for um, membership? Uh, so yeah. It depends on each individual. So it could be managing what? project delivery processes, it could be managing budgets, it could be managing consultants, uh, it can manage, manage staff within your department, it could be managing um, timelines, delivery processes. You know, what? there's a full gambit of management that could constitute for each individual. So if you look at the standards framework, there are various bullet points which outline things we would like you to talk about and potentially incorporate into your submission. And I'm sure some of the other gents might come into other areas as well. Uh, being a course leader for uh, a program leader uh, at Heritage Watt University, uh, I don't know if that's that role is, is a, a type of management because I well, was- yes, You'd thinking. be managing the delivery of the program, you'd be managing the course content, you'd be managing your well, fellow uh, colleagues who are delivering the lectures and the tutors, you'd be managing yeah. the student experience, you'd be managing the output, Oh, that's a great. Thank you so much. Point, there's like six facets there that you could oh, yeah. talk about. Thank you. Thank and you so much. Bring into that's your layers of breadth and depth of management experience right. in that sphere, different to potentially other people in the room. You sound like right. a perfect specialist candidate to me. Sorry, Barry. <laughs> you sound like a perfect speci uh, specialist candidate to me. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. That's that's all from me. That's okay, all. Harry. I see your hands up again. I, uh, yeah, it was it was just in regards to the uh, running your own practice. Um, I don't currently, um, but I did previously. Uh, I ran an architectural practice and a design and build firm. Um, obviously, Is I've not. That whilst changed. you were a member. No. <laughs> there you go, then. Yeah, so basically, Good if it that. happens before Good you were a member, you're not bound by the code of conduct, and obviously. I'm just looking on the database if you are a current member. Oh, you're in trouble now. 
No, he's not in trouble. He's not in trouble. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> a, a, any member or affiliate has to comply by the code. So let's say you do become MCIT and you want to start offering services to the market as a yep. CIT chartered practice, that's a benefit right. that comes with being a full member. Yep. Yeah, of course. There's practice registration protocol to go through. And if you happen to be offering private services and you put that in your application, you know, Gordon, Barry and Paul will not miss that. They will pick that up and there will, will be an email saying, this is what you need to do. These yeah. are the obligations you've signed up to abide by. If you did it before. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not currently supplying any services like that. I, I work for another company now. So. Yeah, that's fine. It's just something that happened before CIAT, so that's not a problem. But we're not saying you can't do it. We're just saying there's certain obligations and expectations of a professional architectural technologist yes. that they need to meet and basically the codes there set by members to protect fellow members so it's in your interest to tick those boxes as it were should that opportunity arise so you know Gordon runs his own CIT charter practice Barry did did run his own practice but he's just sold it on because he's looking to retire and Paul also ran his own charter building consultancy at one point as well so it's, it's a string to your bow that you can offer part-time or full-time it's just something that comes with being a charter member that benefit comes with I actually joined as a, a, a and if it wasn't called affiliate back then. It was, I was a profile member originally, and I I had to when I, when I was a director and in, in in my own practice, I had to be reminded of the uh, the code of conduct and PI insurance at the time. So it, 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 it you won't automatically get sort of expelled from the institute, but you will be reminded initially. And I just dropped onto it. It was sorted out. It wasn't a problem. Fantastic. No, I don't think there's any issues now. Like I said, I don't want to practice anymore. That was you right. could, you could bring that evidence, if you've got it, you could bring that evidence into your submission to show a different sphere or a different sector, but just put an asterisk quantifying, this is something I used to do, I no longer do this, and this yes. is my current yeah, full-time it's, well. it's within my CV, um, so I better believe that with it being in my CV, I need to address it. You know, well, so. what I would say is Section C, is your current role and responsibilities is your main area of practice at the moment <clears throat> as paul has said that should constitute the vast majority of your application because it's more, more your most recent work your most current experience is the thing you can talk about in confidence when you come to interview if you're talking about something five years ago that's in your application <clears throat> and then you then get asked to interview but be like well that was quite a while ago i kind of think it remember it like this and like that whereas if you did something you did three months ago it's a lot fresher in your mind and you'll be able to wax lyrical about it a lot easier so try and pick more recent projects for the majority of the facets of these layers that I talk about. Yeah. Would you want to see a spread of of, uh, of projects? I I mean, I work at the moment within residential, retail and industrial, so. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, so I really want to see something along those lines yeah, would be yeah, great. Yeah, broad base of what you do, examples from each of those. Not an example for everything from each each area, but yes. allow the areas to cover your examples. Yes. So a good, a good spread of your experience. Fantastic. That's brilliant. That's all the questions for me. Thank you. Cheers. James, I'm going to nip out now. That's OK. Yeah, Paul, thank you. I'll let you crack on with other institute work. Back to Cheers. interviewing. OK. OK. Good luck, everybody. Uh, look at me on LinkedIn. If you need any advice, I'm on there. Just message me. OK. Take yeah, care. definitely. If, if I was one of you in this room, I'd be linking with Gordon, Barry and Paul. And if I haven't got a referee or mentor, I might be saying, any chance you can help me out because I know you know the system and you can steer me quite well. Thank you very much. Absolutely. They can only say yes or no, can't they? Absolutely. Sorry, gents. Yeah. I always do that. Bye. Barry, can I just ask your second name, please? The the <laughs> do you want to spell it in the chat I'll, box, I'll, Barry? I'll spell it for you, all right? It's That'd be L fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> I'll put it in the chat box, back, Barry. It's fine. Right. right, any other questions, anybody? Can I just add one thing to these yeah. to these guys? Any of those that are just uh, university graduates, you're going to need a good two to three years experience under your belt before you apply. I don't think you'd have enough experience in, in just doing it after a couple of years. No, I totally agree. And it, it does seem to be a trend where people are contacting me maybe one or two years out of uni and uh, it's, it's too soon. You haven't got any experience, really. Sometimes if you've done a degree part time, uh, that's probably an exemption because you, yeah. you've probably been working with somebody for four or five years. So that might be an exemption. Yeah, but be a bit careful. It is difficult. And and, and I've interviewed people who've only been qualified two or three years and they've been fine. But um, depends where you work. Um, yeah, I, I think two well. years is the quickest I've ever seen anyone do it. That's because they had a good employer, a smaller practice, and they got a good exposure quite early on. So they were doing a bit of everything and anything. So 
I think any yeah, you're probably looking three years plus, as I said at the start of my presentation, to really be somewhere where you think you're there or thereabouts. Some of you, 10, 15, 20 years in industry, you've done it all, really. You, you've done all the hard work. It's that time, energy and motivation to put it down in writing in a structured professional format that someone that's never met you can take a snapshot of you and where you are. But all, all the hard work's done. It's all there. It's all in the project files. You've just got to pull it together, dot the I's, cross the T's and send it through to us. And we still get applications from people in their 60s and 70s want to join. We do. We do. Yeah, I interviewed somebody very briefly and he he was a technician. I suppose he called himself. He was 65 something. His partner was RIBA and his partner died. There are two people in the practice, so he couldn't really carry on. Um, so he he was he was only lacking in a few areas. You young people who whiz on everything like CPDs and stuff. He, he wasn't particularly, um, but with a bit of uh, help, he was fine in the end. So yes, it's uh, all different people we do meet. It's nice to see a mixture of what you do as well, a real good broadband of different elements of a project that you're working on, just to show the rounded character that we're trying to interview. I think just to add to the one that Jamal um, was mentioning, we've got guys who are, um, well, he's a doctor in fire of strategy very high up um we've got guys that uh, work at Felix. we used to have one member who worked at dow corning so there are various industries you can be in and still be a member of the institute so you're not penalized in any way shape or form good stuff so i am going to propose to bring this session to a close if people have no further questions obviously as i said reach out to us, ask for help. If you're not sure, ask a question. We will do our best to get you an answer. If I can't get an answer, Barry Gordon or Paul or any of their other fellow colleagues can probably give you a steer or a clarification. Don't be afraid to reach out. We want to help you on that journey. And for some of you, I should await your completed application in about two to three weeks, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> for, those, for those that have done it, but yeah. Anyway, end of the week, mate. End of the week. End of the week. Well, there we go. That's, All that's right, impressive. I'll be looking at it next Tuesday then. Okay. But I think once it comes in, you probably get a, you probably get a result within a week about the panel, what their decision is. Interview. Which we're booking slots now for the nineteenth of July. So you know, there's sort of a two week, two three week period there. But you know, if there's slots available, there's demand. We can have them every week and make them happen. And as it's Zoom, you know, it's the comfort of your own home or your own office environment. No need to travel. No cost, no face to face, which might be better for you. It might vary, but it's achievable and attainable for all of you relatively quickly. But it's as and when you find the time to fill it in and submit it to us. Well, I've got a, I've got a 5k rise on this. So, um, so soon <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> oh, so it will be coming in on Friday. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks very much, gents. Much appreciated. Um, it's very, very useful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, lucky yeah. Gary there. Let's get cracking. Right. Everybody else, if you've heard enough, thank you for joining us. I said I'll put in the chat box, you know, if you want to see a HNC or an RIBA part one or another product design degree, how they've addressed part one, we can send that over to you. But, you know, you can start working on section C and stage two. If you start doing that, you're working towards getting the main body of work done for, 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 for a majority of you. But thank you very much, Den. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks so very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.